My name is Karina Harney, Playboy's Playmate of the Year, 1992. And I'm Echo Johnson, Miss January, 1994. Welcome to the Bunny Chronicles. Let's go. Welcome back to the show. Today we have a very special guest co-host filling in for us. Um, Miss Karina Harney was not available, so we thought it would be fun to have some of our Playmate sisters come in. So today we have Miss Kathy St. George joining us. Kathy was a Playmate in August of 81. Actually, 82. 82. Okay. And the reason I said 81 is because you had a cover first, yes. which was the, what issue? It was August. It was October of October 81. October of 81. Which is very rare to get the cover first. So, so October 81, centerfold, August mm-hmm. 82. How did that come to be that you got a cover first? Because that is rare. Well, I would ac- actually shot my centerfold with Pompeo. Oh, Pompeo. And cool. they accepted it. And it was, I wish I could get a hold of it now. It was very pretty, and I loved Pompeo. But afterwards, I flew to Chicago and shot some covers okay. with um, Tom Stabler. Okay. And when Hef saw my covers, he looked and he saw this particular one that they decided to go with. He said, you know, I like this cover better than I like her centerfold. Ah. And he made me start all over again, and I shot a second one. I shot a second one a with second centerfold. Second centerfold with Ken Marcus. Okay. Then, and it was perfect, except, believe it or not, my breasts were both facing forward. What was wrong with that? Hef, <laughs> no, no breast facing forward. Hef looked at it and said, This is beautiful, but I want him to reshoot it with one breast this way. And one breast forward. So I will say on that, that completely makes sense because we know as Playboy Playmates and centerfolds, first of all, how grueling it is to shoot your centerfold, but how absolutely particular Hugh Hefner was when it came down to approving in every finite detail. And so you're damn straight that if one of the boobs was not the right direction, he's going to make you reshoot it. So that makes sense. He said, I love her breasts. Thank you, Hef. And uh, but I I want them angled this way. And and it's very expensive. As you know, when we shoot a centerfold, it's all eight by 10 camera Uh and you shoot like five days. Let's talk about what an eight by 10 camera is, because I don't think most of our audience knows what that is. And Mm -hmm. that was that was a trip. It's what they used back in the early centuries. You know, It, it was like a original format, one at a time. Large, you put eight, you put yeah. a cloth over your head mm-hmm. and you're in there, mm-hmm. and it's they slide a a piece of film. It's almost like glass. Right. They slide it in the slot, right? And then they cover their head, and then they shoot it. And so it's and they're very expensive. It's mm-hmm. a very expensive way to shoot, and they would shoot five days of that exactly. So it was one. Think about it in this context for our audience. It was like one large 8 by 10 Polaroid that would come out. Yes. It was then the photographer, lighting, everybody would look at it, make the adjustments. But that was five days straight, yes. usually 10, sometimes 15 hour days in the yes. same exact position or pose that was chosen for you and you could not waver from it. Sometimes it was hard to get out of the pose when you were done. You know? True, true. And um, OK, so so then you did a third one after I did. So then so I did the third one with the b- breast angled the right direction. God forbid. <laughs> and uh, after they accepted it, they loved it. They found out that the blouse I was wearing had been was being worn by Shannon Tweed on the calendar that was coming out. Oh, you know how they do yeah. the calendar. Yeah, she's of wearing the playmate it on the review, cover. and she's they wearing. said absolutely not. We can't have the same shirt. So they shot it again with Arnie Freitag, but I was laying on my stomach. It was a great shot, but my breast didn't show at all. And when Hef saw that, he goes, "Oh no, we, we have see to boobs. see your breasts." Let's just go ahead and take the other one. I don't care if it's in the in the calendar. So we ended up going with that one. So f- I shot four centerfolds and four small cameras with different photographers. Over a span of how long? Almost a year and a half. Holy shit. And then... That's nerve-wracking. I know. And then they used six different uh, photographers working my layout. 
they gave that's unique. They gave somebody every photographer was represented who shot me in my layout. That is very, very cool. And so almost just... all were bed shots, so I look like a slut. But I... <laughs> well, aren't you? Aren't you that whore? A that old bit. whore you call yourself? Bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, th- so that's fascinating because usually or typically, whoever you shot your centerfold with, they shot the centerfold, and then small camera, which yes. was the rest of the layout. Exactly. Would be either like for myself, it was David Meese, but the photographers at that time, Stephen Weta, David Meese, Arnie Freytag, um, who was in Chicago in, well, Pompeo. David, uh, there was a, a David, it was an a- Asian um, name, but I can't remember now. It's like brain dead. And then so, the one that shot um, Karina's good, layout, I can't think of his name. He's no longer alive. He was in Chicago. Chicago. I'm trying to think of some of the ones in Chicago because I worked so much in L.A. I mean, right? There was, yeah. I had Arnie Freitag, Pompeo Pussar, Richard Fegley, Ken Richard Mark. Richard Fegley, that's who, yeah. Love Richard Fegley. Yeah. So that's that's really interesting because then you got a full spectrum. Mm-hmm. And, and each photographer, yes, equally as amazing, but definitely had their own unique style. I know. So I'm sure that you could see that in your layout. Oh, yes. I looked different. In some you of the pictures, tell. I looked different because each one sort of captured you in their vision. Uh-huh. And so it was very versatile. The layout was very versatile. And I even had the the photographer, Dick Bruin, who tested me originally mm-hmm. to send to Playboy mm-hmm. for them to do a test. They put one of his in, too. Interesting. Yeah. And how old were you? I was actually 27. That's considered old to be testing oh, yeah. for Playmate. Wow. It came out. There's only a handful of Playmates I know that were in their late 20s that got approved. It came out my 28th birthday, and it was for my 10-year high school reunion. <laughs> it was love, so great. I love it. <laughs> so. Well, how did your journey even begin to become? Did you know you wanted to be a Playmate, or how did that even come to be? It used to be, I used to read play, look at Playboys when I was young. I thought they were beautiful women. So and you had I, an affinity I for thought, I would, I would love to be a Playboy several. They're so pretty. Yeah. And then um, I was, believe it or not, in an aesthetics school, learning aesthetics, because I was a makeup artist and thought, I just moved back to California. It's probably good to learn aesthetics because it broadens my chances of getting work and things like sure. that. And I was sitting in the room, and they had they brought in a makeup artist who did photography for, you know, like magazines and things like that. And she pulled me out of the audience to do my makeup. Mm-hmm. And when we were done, she handed me her card and said, I know um, a photographer who would love to shoot a Wii cover. Mm. And you would be perfect. And we was also owned by Playboy at the time. Okay. Okay. It was the European version of Playboy. Got it. So uh, I said, okay. So when I went and met with a photographer, and I had never modeled, and I said, I would actually love to test for Playboy because I really, I had just been divorced, moved across the country, and I really needed to make some money because I left my husband mm. pretty much everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But a hundred dollars for gas to get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm gas out of was here. cheaper then. <laughs> yeah, it was like twelve cents a gallon. Yeah, I drove from Florida to California on a hundred dollars. <laughs> you know, but um, he so he decided to test me. And we did some shooting, and uh, they they sent it into Linda Kenny. Mm-hmm. Who's Linda Kenny? Linda Kenny used to be Marilyn's um, Marilyn Grabowski, Grabowski, who is the West Coast uh, sort of her assistant, okay. our co editor. I mean, not co editor, but assistant editor. But she also did the makeup too back then. Now, is it true that you had to do your own makeup for your centerfold? Yes, I did. That I is did so all bizarre. my own makeup. <laughs> now, why? And they got why? it cheaper than if somebody else had done it. <laughs> why did you have to do your own makeup? Well, they thought I was a really good makeup artist because okay. I had done so many Playmates. In that time, I would started... Oh. Well, when I first tested, I said to them, and I looked at her kit. Now, I had never done photography makeup in my life. I had worked for Estee Lauder training makeup artists for years, and 
but I lied. And they called me two days later after they tested me and said, what do you charge for makeup? And I had no clue what to say. And I said, $200. They said, okay. And they hired me. So you started working for Playboy. Right away. First, and then became Yeah, famous. I mean, I shot. Right, you were shooting. Yeah, because it took you a year and a half to actually get yes. the centerfold. So approved. I shot in the studio. I worked in the studio at least three days a week. That's so neat. Yes, I got to meet a lot of the playmates. I bet. I could help them with posing because I had done it. Exactly. It was, it was a a win, win, win. You absolutely. Know? So absolutely. And they have used to call me Mother Hen because I took care of my girls. You right. Know? <laughs> so you and Huff were you and Huff were were close. And and I also just want to bring up the fact that you know you're from the eighties. I'm mm-hmm. you know from the nineties and. Coming into the mansion, you know, in 93, Hef was married to Kimberly, and you would hear about what it was like, you know, previously. And mm-hmm. we didn't get to actually witness that until Hef and Kimberly got divorced and the party started happening all over yeah. again. But what was it like in the 80s? What was it like at the mansion? What was Hef like? What was going on in his world? What was the company doing? It was so much fun. Now, I met you, Hefner, because they hired me to do his makeup for Halloween. Oh. And I was a nervous wreck. I had to make him a vampire. <laughs> and I remember because there was a German issue of Playboy, uh, a shoot that Philip Dixon did. And I loved the way the makeup was done for this vampire, you know. So I kind of went with that. And I did his makeup. And I wanted to put this per- this very deep sort of purple really inside his lips so his lips look thin and menacing. Right, right. The color would only be in here. And Hef said, oh, no, I can't wear make. I can't wear lipstick. And I said, why? He said, people think I'm gay. <laughs> he did not. I swear to God. People will think I'm gay. I go, oh, yeah, that's what they're going to think. <laughs> so it was a hard no. No, it was a hard no. <laughs> you weren't able to do it. <laughs> and then I told him what I was going to be. It was my very first party at the Playboy Mansion. And I had bought this little beautiful body stocking in gold. And I made the tail with a bow on it, and I made ears for my head, and I made this gold horn with cord around it and glitter, cool. and I went as a unicorn. And have said, do you know how many horny jokes you're going to hear tonight? <laughs> I said, it's okay. But I'm so short that every time I went to hug somebody, I poked him in the neck with my horn. With your horn, right? No <laughs> kidding. <laughs> so that was your introduction yes. to the beginning of, of your... Um... I mean, I had gone up a couple times, but I'd, I was afraid to talk to him, you know? Yeah, I mean? no, it's yeah, certainly the first time that, you know, that you're there or, or you know, wish to meet him. It's, you know, there's an element of like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and you're, you're a little that, off guard. you know, when you've been one-on-one so close, yeah. after that, he was always nice to me. Oh, he hello. was, yeah, he's... Such Always a kissed me hello, mm-hmm. and and I also did Sandra Theodore's makeup the same night as Supergirl. So he was with Sandra Theodore mm-hmm. at that time. Yeah, yes. that's right, because it had been the early eighties. Yes, and that, they were together for five years. They were together for you a know, while. I didn't get there till eighty, and but they were together before that, mm-hmm. and they were together till at least eighty two uh-huh. that I know of. And and she ended up being my roommate. I ended up moving. It was Sandra and Kelly Tuff in L A. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So it was fun. And it comes full circle. Because she was never there. She's always with Hef. So I right. had her room. <laughs> right, right, right. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, that good. worked out perfectly. She had a beautiful apartment. <laughs> so realistically, though, you you worked consistently with Playboy for decades, you know? Well, I did. I worked with the magazine for like two years um, a lot. Mm-hmm. And I even trained some of the makeup artists that came in. And then they undercut my Such prices, as. which you don't want to do that. But who did you train? I trained uh, Tracy. Okay. Okay. Tracy, when she came in with Steve Wade. And um, but once my centerfold came out, they used me less because I was doing promotions and things like that. And then um, they would have me come in for special things like celebrities doing uh, pictorials, Mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of celebrities, Fran Jeffries, you Uh know, and. And what is it, Rita Jenneret and all these people. And then, um, and then, so then I didn't work as much with them. But then when the channel came out. I oh, started, the Playboy channel. Yeah, I started mm-hmm. working all the time. I would do all the host wraps for the girls. So explain what host wraps are for our audience. Okay. Whenever a new girl uh, would, get, it was her month of her centerfold, the, of, you know, her promotion month, uh, they would do little like spots or 
introductions to shows and things like that, like they would use the Playmate to say, and here we go with Mm -hmm. Playmate bloopers or welcome to Playboy Channel. You were the host for the month, basically, when it was. And and they would just pop you in all through the the month. Yeah, I remember recording that. And I remember going home with like half the wardrobe because I loved it. Oh, yeah, that's lucky. I wish I thought of that. (laughs) And every time I went back to the mansion, I was like, oh, my God, I just love the way I look so much. I would just keep my makeup on and like find a reason to go out. Do you know, everybody (laughs) did that whenever I used to do makeup for the girls. They loved my work. They'd say, I got to go out tonight now. I know. You didn't want to waste And it. one of them was, I think it was Cindy Woods, who was Playmate of the Year in the 70s. And she also uh, did a spot on Apocalypse Now. Mm-hmm. But she said, I actually slept with my head looking straight up so that I could wear it the next day, too. So uh, in the 80s, then, that would have been the era of the Playboy Clubs as well, right? Did you ever work at any of the clubs or do events there? And what were they like? I did events. I I did promotions, like in Great Gorge, I did one. And um, I think that's one of the only ones I actually worked worked at. But I did, when I traveled, if I was traveling, sometimes I would go to the clubs Mm -hmm. to check them out, you Mm -hmm. know? The Chicago one and also New York, I went. I went to the New York club mm-hmm. quite a bit. And then I actually went to one of the last New York clubs, which is only like six, seven years ago, maybe less. <laughs> yeah, that lasted for about two years. But we can we can lay that on the new Playboy because they but certainly they don't have, have any idea how to run that company. They didn't have any of our centerfolds hanging in. That's of course why not. It went no. to- you know what? <laughs> the, um, that the new Playboy, they had they have made it such a point to completely remove themselves from any affiliation with Hugh Hefner. And it is so baffling to me. I know. And it is so wrong. And what they have now gone on and created, it's like, it's not Playboy. I mean, it's 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 a it's a joke to me. Well, the thing is, uh, I think in a sense they were trying to create something a little more. I mean, Playboy with Hef, he it was an institution. Yeah. But once you buy something like that and Hef's not there, you have to almost go another direction because you can't keep going back to someone, especially God rest his soul, he passed away. Yeah. So they were trying to still make Playboy something. Mm-hmm. So they kind of went, took it another direction. I mean, some of the clothes are really cute that they sell, but yeah. but the fact is it's sad because it's not Playboy. You well, know? you know what's really interesting? Um, so all of the international publications continue to create and produce the beautiful, glossy publication each month around the world. In America, we are the only ones that do not create the publication. With that said, I understand how expensive it was to create the publication. And with Hef gone, you know, there was no way that I think you could carry on that caliber unless, you know, Cooper had stayed on. But Cooper, for his own decisions, decided to go because he saw the writing on the wall and the direction it was going and he didn't want to be a part of it. But um, I don't know. There's just so many things that they've done that it's just it's it's bizarre to me that it's now just turned into a a merchandising brand. That's right. And then the centerfold, which did you know that they trademarked the term centerfold? So when you go on to playboy.com now, it says, look at our new Playboy or new uh, Playmate of the Month. They direct you into centerfold and it's only fans. So it's every type of woman you can imagine doing anything you can imagine. Oh, no. So gross. And what a slap in the face to us. Oh, my God. You know, that's the thing is when they put it, when they make it less than... Mm -hmm. It makes us less than. Exactly. You know, because exactly. that is, that's why I I really have, I have no complaints about any of the time I went to the mansion. No, I mean, I had more fun than I should have been allowed. <laughs> and also, it was like my second home. Mm-hmm. I used to go up For there. For a lot of us, it was. I used to go up on Tuesday and Thursday nights because Hef played Monopoly every Tuesday, Thursday. And I would go up in my pajamas with a ponytail on top of my head. And when I say my pajamas, they weren't pretty pajamas. They <laughs> were sweats. Yeah. And I'd wear a ponytail on top of my head. I just didn't like being alone all the time. So I would go up there and I'd lay on the couch while he played Monopoly and order a BLT with avocado, which was my favorite, yes. with Joni. And I would eat and hang out with them till yeah. it was bedtime. And then I would drive back to my apartment because it was very close. But... 
you could go up. You didn't have to be beautiful up there. He didn't yeah. care. He loved us even when we look, had curlers in our hair, yeah, you know? Absolutely. He loved us. He, 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 he respected us. He loved us. And he loved us being around. And that was the beauty of it. It was a second home to all of us. And there was... I'll say an open door policy, but, you know, that wasn't for everybody. But certainly a a good amount of us, were we in town or did we live in Los Angeles and we wanted to come up? Absolutely. Come on up. That's right. It was amazing to have access to that whenever. I had a 20, I was on a 24 hour list. Yeah, there was a 24 hour list. I would go after I went out drinking. Stop and have steak and eggs. <laughs> like I'm hungry. Soak, Let's soak go up eat. the alcohol Let's go eat at the all by myself, in the, and then I'd go home because I feel better. You know, <laughs> that was the best. Was the 24 hour room service? Oh my, my God, God. whatever, so whenever you fun. wanted. And the girls were very close. It was very much sorority like. Absolutely, we to hung this out day. there. We hung out there by the pool all the time. We worked out together. We would do aerobics classes and everybody come up and, and it was just so much fun. And sometime, one time he had emus though. I don't know what possessed him to get them. You know, they're like ostriches. Yeah. That's the only animal I didn't like or bird I didn't like that he got because it, it would come would, after you. It would come after mm-hmm. me and steal my sandwiches. <laughs> and I go, I just got the sandwich. <laughs> Uh, the zoo, the zoo at the at the mansion. Did you know that that um, I think it's the only home probably in California that had a zoo license. And, and that's the and one thing it, that forest. It was considered a forest. And a natural too. forest. Yeah, right. Forest. Um, uh, Darren Montopoulos, who bought the mansion, um, did keep the animals there. Okay. That is my understanding. So I'm yeah, sure that bird. he's maintaining the the zoo license because that was such a beautiful part of it. The grounds and, you know, the wildlife everywhere. And he got rid of the aviary, which I was sad because yeah, that was that so beautiful. Yeah, that happened a long time before, though. But. but I remember once there was a bird, one of the bigger birds, and it would sit by the pool and you'd walk by the bird. And it would go bump, deep bump, bump, deep bump. Was it a parrot? I don't know what kind of bird it was. It was a big one, but somebody taught it that. You that know, to is funny. Bump de bump, bump de bump, <laughs> like we goes. were shaking it. Exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah. Look at the ladies shaking that ass when they walk by. And then there was one that was like losing its feathers. It was pretty old, and and half was thinking yeah, it might be time to get rid of it because it was looking pretty scary, you yeah. know. And um, we taught it to say, "I love you, half." Aww. And after that, he couldn't get rid of it, you know? Cause, yeah, he was like, I You know, he's a sucker for all that love. <laughs> <laughs> One of his many uh, philanthropic endeavors, you know, was... Um the the wildlife um foundation and that's one of multiple things that he had his name attached to which we will be talking about mm-hmm. over the next um you know series of shows that we do and i think it'll really surprise people because he, oh, yes. he was Are involved you in so he loved, many he loved animals. Eh, and animals were and he, he loved birds and he loved everything you know and, and the thing what i love and he loved us cuz what i loved about him as he always had my doll in the house because when you are all hanging out together all these girls you sync up and when you've got pms going all at the same time <laughs> he would always have my doll in the house for us <laughs> so we would take our mind that's right it would always be in all the bathrooms all stopped. and you know that you can't do that anymore what? I'm towards provide the, my doll. You can't you can't even give someone an aspirin in your home and have and that was at the mansion too. Towards the last few years, you can't even give someone an aspirin. Nothing. Oh shit! Why well, gave you Excedrin this morning? Am well, I in you trouble? know, I'm not going to sue you, <laughs> but it was because if something happened, if somebody was allergic or whatever, he it, you just can't give out any medication anymore. Huh. In a house. Well, it's a different time yes. that we Unless, live in. Well, back then they'd give you, you know, well, Hef didn't, but other parties I went to, they try to give you quaaludes and everything. But now, thank God that they've changed the rules. And um, will you talk about that? Because obviously there's the, the prevalent um, narrative going around by we know who. That, you know, multiple things have been said about half that, you know, he abused drugs and he gave drugs out to all the girls and he was, you know, sexually abusive. And it, the list goes on and on and on, which we all know is the furthest thing from the truth. But you certainly at that era in the 80s when when drugs were uber, uber prevalent. Yes. And you didn't even witness it. I have never gave the women drugs. 
uh, I happen to know where the girls got their and, drugs. And this is at the same time that you were roommates with Sandra Theodore and yes. Sandra was with Half. Yes. And we know what was said in The Dark Secrets of Playboy. Yes. And that's not true. And I know who she bought her drugs from. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't you, Hefner. Yep. And also, um, I mean, they were, but Hef really, I mean, he knew they were going to be done. He wanted them done. If you're going to do something like that. He didn't want to see it. He, he didn't, didn't want to know it. about it. Because if he did, you yeah. would be taken off the ground. Yes. Yeah. And the only thing is he would say, please be careful. Because if you do it in the bathroom, because one of his best friends, jo uh, John, mm -hmm. Dante, had a dog named Louie, a little poodle got that loved cocaine. <laughs> the, pood the poodle that loved cocaine. cocaine. And he, if he got out of the bedroom before the floors were cleaned in the bathroom, he would go lick it up. He would go lick it up. So he was so worried about that dog. He'd say, please don't do it, you know, because... We have a dog with a problem, you know. <laughs> we have a dog who's <laughs> addicted. <laughs> we can't have that. And so please don't do it in the house. Oh my god! You that know, is... so he cared about that dog. I mean, it was so cute. That, but the worst part is, if you were doing it, the dog would come up and lick your nose, and and wow. you'd be going, "Oh, I just got outed." Yeah. Wow, because the dog could smell from miles away. Which, and I thought, like beeline. I thought it just liked me. <laughs> Little did I know. <laughs> That's hysterical. I mean, it was, you know, it was something everybody went through. I mean, I had Well, in the it. 80s, it was that was the time. Everybody was doing cocaine. I was and like, I, I did, did my I did my centerfold party at Studio 54. Oh, you did? No. How fun. Yes. Uh, when my my centerfold came out. Oh, cool. Um, it was at Studio 54, and when and they had all these headshots float down from the ceiling, and it was my my girlfriend is a centerfold playing. Oh my gosh, that's it was legendary. So it was so cute. A lot of great people came. How fun. So it was a lot of fun. Speaking of, um, you know, that era and parties and the mansion and whatnot, I'm sure you met tons of fabulous celebrities yes. of that era. Do you have any fun stories, funny stories? Well, it's, uh, I well, I met a lot of celebrities there. I, I don't really have, I don't really have, I mean, I have fun stories outside the mansion too because of just the relationships you that you form with these people yeah because you yeah. you actually get to become friends with some of them you know right. and it's 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 a lot of fun but um i i never fooled around with anybody up at the mansion except for one person and that was cuz i was already dating him and he came up and i who was thought, it oh i better not oh, if dude. you were dating him i was dating him I only had sex once at the mansion. That shows you what a clean place it was. Um, Tony Danza. <laughs> Hottie <laughs> McHotty. I love me some Tony Danza. How cool. You guys are friends to this day. To this day, You were just yes. talking about him. Yes. Aww. He's a dear friend. And he came to my party when I did it at studio. His whole family came. His mother, everybody came. Very cool. So it was really fun. And the next day, after the party, I went fishing with him. In the morning, we went out to Long Island. I went fishing with his dad. <laughs> And his cousin, and I'd been up all night. But luckily, I wasn't doing any drugs or anything. I just was up. Yeah. It's like my adrenaline was yeah. going because it was my centerfold. My God. You yeah, know? of course. Of so course. So it's really fun. Of course. So if there's three things that, um, or three words that define half to you, what would those three words be? I don't think he would like that I say this, but he was very fraternal to me. He looked after me a lot. And like if I had a boyfriend that I broke up with, it was all sad. He'd sit and talk to me for two hours. That's how it. he was, though. Oh, yes. He was very protective mm -hmm. of me. Uh, we like to joke around. In fact, a lot of the pictures I have of us you guys to are this day, up. we're both laughing, mm -hmm. you know. So he was a good friend to me as well. And um, I... I think he's one of the best people and made the biggest lasting impression of Iconic. pretty much anybody in my life. Yeah. I mean, I felt like he was a father to me. I felt, but I also he was really handsome. Mm. I said, when he passed away, I said, now I wish I had sex with him. <laughs> and somebody said, why? I said, because it's harder to lose a lover than it is to lose a father. <laughs> 
That's funny. But don't tell him I thought he was a father because, you know, he was really hot, you know, looking when I met him. He was, no, but I think that would be the general um, but agreement he just, is that, you know, he 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 did make sure that we were looked after and it was very, very important to him. You know? Yes. And especially the play, the playmates that had a close friendship with mm -hmm. him, you know, and they would. They would sit down and talk to him mm -hmm. about whatever it was that was going on in their lives, whether it be romantic issues or not. And he was always there. And, and he would, he would talk and to he, you yeah. about personal yeah. things. Sometimes he'd stop and tell me something. I mean, one time he, he stopped me and he said, you know, that girl I told you I really liked. I go, yeah. And I was outside and he goes, well, we finally got together last night. And I said, congratulations. He said, I just hope she remembers me. <laughs> I said, you have that problem, too? <laughs> I hope she remembers me. Duh. I said, so. you had that problem. You're insecure, too. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so funny. Okay, two more words. Two more words. Okay. Um, God, that's really, it's hard for me to think of this. Um, the most, f well, fun. I mean, I had more fun with Hef. I mean, it was just like the most magical time of my life. And to, and to have that, that experience, to be able to go up there, it was like a second home. I always felt welcome. I never felt pressured. I never felt like, that's why I don't understand how these people were in the same house I was, but I never saw any of that stuff. Right. Isn't that interesting? I never saw any of it. I was like, should I be insulted? Mm -hmm. Did he never try, you know, but he... I mean, he, he did express uh, the desire to have me come up and visit him upstairs. Sure. Which is totally. Yeah. And, and that that happened. That happened to me as well. And I'm sure that happened to many playmates. Yes. And it was very If you wanted to go upstairs, go upstairs. If you didn't want to go upstairs, you didn't go upstairs. I would say thank you so, exactly. so much. I appreciate it. I had a great time, but I'm going to go to bed. No problem, darling. Give me a kiss. Good night. That's it. You know what I said the first time? I said, listen, I. Just got a divorce. I married the first guy I slept with. You wouldn't want to sleep with me? I said, <laughs> I'm telling you now, it could be a real buzzkill. <laughs> a real buzzkill. <laughs> I said, let me get a little experience in my life first. And he hugged me and he goes, you go for it, girl. That go get some experience. <laughs> that is so funny. I love it. I'd be a real buzzkill. <laughs> Oh. I'd be a real buzzkill in bed. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of these words to explain to him. Just... I feel a complete loss, loss also when that he's gone. Yeah, when he because passed. Because I will tell you that he was such an important part of my life. And and with not to have him anymore, not to know he's not there anymore is was really a loss. I yeah, had, yeah, for everybody. And you know, it's like, you know, obviously we knew that the time was going to come when he would pass. But gosh, when we all got that news. Ugh, I know. That was so heavy. Sad. And I and then, didn't spend a lot of time with him towards the end because. Well, nobody did. Nobody and had access to that's what hurt me the him. most was yeah. because I'd always had access to him. And all of a sudden, it's like having your friend taken all away All of his closest you. friends lost access to him, mm -hmm. as you know. Everybody that that was on that 24-hour list that were his closest confidants mm -hmm. for decades and decades, all of a sudden, you're not allowed to come up to the mansion. We can leave I mean, I that used to, up for I what used you to think. I email but... him funny mm -hmm. pictures or stories or things I'd read, and he'd always get back to me. And yeah, and then all of a sudden you weren't even allowed to email him. Yeah, we were yeah. allowed. All to communication him. was completely cut off. That's what are you gonna th th do? You know, I think that'll make anybody pass away. Well, I that had, much faster. I had a, a medium contact me, and she'd been trying to get a hold of me for months and months and months. And she finally got a hold of me, and she was on the phone, and I and she's in Pittsburgh, and I hadn't seen her in four years, and I said, "I'm so sorry to get back to you. What's going on?" She goes. I have to call you because these three men keep coming and talking to me. And one of them I know is your father because I've seen him before. The other one I think is your father. And one of them wears a smoking jacket, a half. pipe. It was half. And I said, it's my three fathers. <laughs> <laughs> it's my three fathers. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, no. well, that actually, that's a good segue then to ask you this. Had you had the opportunity to say anything to Hef before he passed, what would you have said? Get rid of that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, count on Kathy.
Kathy, keep it real. Well, that probably was the general consensus from all of us. I know. I mean, I I couldn't figure out a way to kill her, but <laughs> trust me, it did go through my mind. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. Yeah, he was too good a person to be cut off from the people who loved him. And plus, that was his life. That was his livelihood. He thrived on having people around him. That's why the, the mansion was, was open in that capacity, and every single night something was planned, and that, and that, Never, Hef never swayed from that plan or those no. calendar of events. He was religious about everything that he did. I know. And then for that just to completely disappear, I mean. And you, sometimes I remember when you'd go to the movies and certain nights he played old movies. Mm-hmm. Like he loved old and old. I think that was Friday nights. Friday nights. Yeah. It didn't used to be back in the old days. It was always new movies Friday and Sunday. But then it became Friday night was the old movies. And so you'd be watching a Hitchcock movie or something. But what I love the most is before each movie, he had done research. Yeah. And he would look up trivia about it. Mm-hmm. And it was an Ingrid Bergman and I think Cary Grant was in it. And I wish I could think of the name of it, but it was a Hitchcock film. And he said, and he read this whole thing about it, this period of time. He said, first of all, you know, he read, he tells you all about the, the actors. And then he says, and did you, you will notice in the kissing scenes that none of the kisses last more than a certain amount of seconds because oh, it was illegal back then. Really? It was illegal to have a kiss go longer than, I think, 30 seconds. So they, you'll notice that they break the kiss and then go back to the kiss because if they break it, then it's they that can is go a back to fascinating it. factoid. I, I never Who knew. And he always showed an old Warner Brothers cartoon before the movie too, yeah. and it was so much fun. Well, and that just you know speaks to have you know ultimate love affair with cinema, and then his multiple philanthropic endeavors surrounding preserving cinema, mm-hmm. and then addressing censorship in cinema, and specifically the two endowments that were made um, USC and. It's my understanding that I do think that Hef did end up going a handful of times and teaching that class at USC. And then there's also a endowment at UCLA that honored him. But it's all around the preservation of cinema. And he would always talk about, you know, as as a kid. I mean, that that was that's what he did. He watched movies. And ultimately, that's what he you know, created the the centerfold on was those movie stars of that yes, era, you know, exactly. and it all comes, you know, full circle. I know. And the, and what he also loved so much, he loved his scrapbooking, remember? Oh, yeah. He, would well, he was in the, in the room. Guinness Book of World Records for scrapbooking. Did you know that? I did not uh-huh. know that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. But he lo- he'd sit in a floor on the floor surrounded by pictures and stuff and pick them out to put in his books. His whole life is scrapbook. Yeah, the scrapbooking was was prevalent. I mean, and he would do that. He would do that every single day of his life. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a dedicated room at the mansion for scrapbooking. My daughter is even in in the albums from, you know, from the um from the Easter events. I mean, all of us are in there, you know, on top of just his entire life. I mean, talk about I wonder where the scrapbooks are. Hopefully the HMH Foundation has them. I know. It's it's weird because I remember calling uh the archives and things like that. And towards the end when Hef was not there anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but I remember because they, they put a pictorial up for me. Um, this was after I sh- reshot my cover, but it was like in August, they did this whole pictorial of me. It was pictures I'd never seen. Right. And I called them and asked if they had any of the uh, special edition pictures because we shot so many for that. And one of them, a few of them were never used because they just, I don't know, got lost in the in the library or something and they did not even have those anymore. They did not have any of the special edition pictures, only original centerfold stuff. Actually, I I do know that um it was probably a year and a half ago when uh we did a round table with the PMOYs, Renee Tennyson, Brandy Roderick, um Karina Harney, obviously. And I was trying to pull photos and I went on to playboy.com. And if you dig deep, you can actually find the Playmates and et cetera. And they have all our libraries. But I did see a lot of uh, content content in there 
photos particularly that I had not seen of myself and as well as Renee Tennyson. So you might want to look in there and see if you if there are anything. I in should there. because I you don't might, have, you I might don't have a password, believe it or not. No. I don't think you have to have a password for this for oh, the really? playmates. Uh uh-uh. uh. Because it always wants me to join. You know, in <laughs> hey, the old hey, Playboy, if we're old, playmates, yeah. can we get a pass? Well, in the old days when they started the website. We did get a password. Yeah. We we got to see it free. And we also got a monthly issue of Playboy free. And I, probably for 20, 25 years, I got it. And then that stopped. So did you know that um, I was a driving force behind Playboy.com being established? Oh, no. Yeah. So I was the second uh, playmate to figure out that the Internet was here and it was it was here to stay. Mm-hmm. And there was a huge opportunity there. So Christina Liradini did it first and then myself. And I taught myself how to build websites. And then I had a, a, you know, a highly successful membership based website for probably like five years. Um, But I remember being in Chicago and having a conversation with Christy Hefner about it, like the importance of this. And, you know, you guys are behind the eight ball. And again, it went back to, you know, Hef wasn't very sure on it. You know, of course, he didn't understand it, nor did he believe that it was like here to stay. So um, finally, when, you know, they started to see that, you know, more and more websites were coming on board and whether it was Playmates or not, but women were making, you know, money and that's that's the way of the future. And so you better make sure that you do that. So uh, when Cindy Rakowitz came in, she she spearheaded that and got that done with Christy Hefner. But I do remember having a conversation with Christy about it. Like, this is uber important. <laughs> well, I do know that— And it was a massive undertaking for them to do with the amount of, um, you know, catalogs and, and photos and archives they had. I mean, it's a gold mine for mm-hmm, them. Mm-hmm. I started a website, and I had, like, 15 Playmates. Uh, didn't use Playboy or any of that stuff. Um, but it was still— You know, it was new, it was new but it was after the— the websites were starting, you know, and I got sued <laughs> by Playboy. Well, they, but, they came after me, too. But we came uh, to a resolution that as long as I um, uh, use the registered trademark of mm-hmm. Playboy, that I could go ahead and use it. Um, and then in, I want to say it was 2000, there was that landmark case with, with Terry Wells. With Terry Wells, yes. exactly. Granting. Not only us, but if Miss America, Miss Universe, whatever title that you were, you have every right to use that in perpetuity for the rest of your life because that is your title. That's right. You don't lose a title. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, maybe what's the Miss America that posed nude for Playboy? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) She got it yanked. But other than that. Once you're a playmate, you'll yeah. always be a playmate. Yeah, that was a, that was definitely a landmark case, and and you know since then I uh, even had the new Playboy you know send me cease and desist orders because I had registered um, a domain with the word playmate in there, and I wrote back and I said it would behoove you to know this case. I will not be relinquishing my domain, and this is my right. And I never heard from them again. Well, see, the thing is, they didn't actually sue me; they just threatened, and they were going to tie me up, and right. so. I decided it just wasn't worth it. But then I started to do my own website. It wasn't a bunch of the girls. And I got ripped off five times. And finally, I said, God's trying to tell me something. So I never got a website up. But now I had all those pictures right. that I had shot. Right. So when I went on the road and started doing you Comic Cons, I had 155 or 160. And I still have more than that. I've just, those are only the ones I've printed up. Yeah. You know, and I had so much stuff to sell because of it. So it worked out great. Yeah. No kidding. Same. I, I ended up counting my galleries and I personally own like 36,640 images that I produced for my galleries. That I'm now going to utilize and I'm making digital art out of them and other things. But at the end of the day, like you were saying, going Mm -hmm. to the autograph conventions, I had so many other pictures from shooting for five years for my personal website and a new gallery every week. So think about that. I know that was really cool that we, you know, were able to to take that opportunity and monetize it. And it was I know when I went to do Comic Cons. I could only put my photos, non-nude photos out, like my swimsuit stuff, sure. my bench warmer things, things like that. And then in a, a tall magazine box, you know, that you, I would have it open and it had, you know, like little, like vintage nudes, mm-hmm. nudes, non-nudes, vintage non-nudes. And people could do it like this Smart. and no child could see over the top. Yeah. So Smart. 
So I sold them like that. But And uh, you did Comic-Con for five years. You did that circuit, didn't you? I did Comic-Cons, horror conventions, and uh, I probably did sometimes two a month, sometimes more. Um, I supported myself for five years, but I traveled everywhere, and I mm-hmm. did it all by train mm-hmm. because cool. it was too expensive to carry all your supplies, your sign, everything on a plane. They charged you so much. Sure. But on a train, because I lived in New York and it was close to everything. And most of them are over there. They're in the Midwest. Yeah. And I traveled by train. And like if I left at 430 in the afternoon in New York, I got to Chicago 930 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I would do the show. I do two shows there, usually Glamour Con and Wizard. So I would always do two in one week. Very cool. And, um, they're very, very lucrative. 2008, it kind of, it kind of hurt because you know the economy was weird in 2008. Mm-hmm. But I supported myself for a long time, and I got to meet so many lovely people too. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. You know, it's like joining the circus doing those shows. <laughs> You go off and join the circus, circus, you know? I love it. Okay. So um, had you had the chance to say anything to Hef before he passed, what would you have said to him, told him, what comes to mind? I love you. Yeah. And then I would have thrown my arms around him and my legs around him and not let go. I love it. (laughs) Because you never know when they're going to be taken away from you. I always get tears when we talk about this and I ask my guests this. It brings back. A lot. <laughs> and we're and, so grateful. And we were thanks part. for the memories. I mean, memories. <laughs> <laughs> she means memories, people, not the memories. <laughs> I meant both. <laughs> she meant both. That's great. <laughs> okay. So Kathy is going to be filling in for the next couple round of shows. I'm so, so excited. Much to her dismay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Thank so, you. Um, yeah, we'll see you next time for our next interview with Candace Jordan I coming can't up. Wait. I can't wait. That's going to be her. fabulous. Thank you so much for having me on the show. You got it. Thanks so much for fun. being here. I appreciate it. I'm Echo. I'm Kathy St. George. And this is The, the Bunny, Bunny Chronicles. Chronicles. We'll see you next time. <laughs>